Uh, Rabia's Divine Love. Welcome. I've been somewhat remiss in not having made a vlog on Rabia or Rabia of Basra before. After all, her Sufi thoughts are possibly as important as those of Rumi, whom, as you know, I adore. Now, you could see this as me reflecting uh, the misogyny, which can be found within some parts of Islam, despite people denying it. But, but no, it can, and I profusely apologise for it. Um, or you could see it as simply re reflecting the suppression of women for economic and political reasons the world over, something which isn't exclusive to Islam. Uh, but I don't think that's the reason. Um, I mean, it's the reason is twofold. Firstly, Islamic scholars from this early period are overlooked regardless of their gender. Uh, but secondly, it's a very difficult vlog to do. Um, now, I don't think I'm going to criticise Rabia, but, you know, saying anything negative about Rabia is, about, is a bit like saying something negative about Mother Teresa or Gandhi. Or, you know, it, it, it's... You do so at your peril. And I suppose it's also a bit little like me trying to do a vlog on Alistair Crowley. I'm not too certain what I can add. But, as I say, I'm remiss in not having done one, so I have to do it. Um, you see, there's so little that's said about Rabia that can actually be authenticated. And I have to say that I'm incredibly distrustful of the modern day cult of Rabia. Rabia of Basra. Rabia of Basra, she was born somewhere around 714 to 718, and um, she died around 1801. Uh, she was, or oh, she is, an Arab Muslim saint and Sufi mystic. Although her time predates the use of the word Sufi, or even an identifiable movement. And, you know, even this is politically charged, because there are some Muslims who would deny the existence of such a movement at this time. So much that's been written about her, well, everything that's been written about her was written at least centuries after her death. And I have to say, I, I take a lot of it with a pinch of salt. Not least, as too often the timing of events don't secret, uh, synchronise. Now, what I have to say is I'm not doubting her greatness. I'm simply doubting some of the stories of her greatness. Uh, certainly that they uh, that sh that should not mean that we should rubbish everything that's claimed about Rabia simply because some is refutable so you know that th there's a th there's always a danger when something is proven to be wrong of throwing out the baby with the bathwater it's a bit like you know sea theories at the moment it seems to me there's a nugget of truth in some sea theories uh, but people are purposely creating more and more outlandish sea theories to discredit those that might have some truth in them. Um, many of the stories, uh, you know, there are many stories of miracles surrounding her life. Um, but of course, <coughs> this you'd have to have stories of miracles to be accepted as a saint within Islam or, or in Catholicism. She's known in some parts of the world as Hazrat Bibi Rabia Basri, Rabia al-Basri or simply Rabia Basri uh, because she's said to have been born in Basra, Iraq to the uh, Kais tribe and she was the fourth daughter of her family so they named her Rabia which simply means fourth. 
after the death of her father, famine took over Rabia and she was parted from her sisters. Most people suggest that she became a slave girl, but she was eventually freed. Indeed, uh, this story is, occurs so regularly there's probably some truth about it. A less reliable is, and, and I've not seen any Muslims suggesting this, but some Christians suggesting that she was a sex slave, although most, uh, many Muslims claim that she died a virgin. I have to admit that, you know, from what we know about her, uh, maybe we should not discount this story entirely. And certainly if she had been a slave at that time, I, I doubt if she would have died a virgin. But, you know, it's not for me to speculate on such issues. It's said that after she, she left slavery or after she was freed, she went into the desert, some say with, Buzl um, with Bedouin, uh, to pray. And she became an ascetic, living a life of semi-seclusion. Indeed, she saw poverty as a gift. There is a story, of, uh, a latter story of, of her later in life, of a thief attempting to burgle her house. And she told him to take anything. But there was frankly nothing worth taking. I mean, there's a bit more to that story than that, but I don't see any point in repeating it. It's just a story. Um... She's often cited as being the queen of saint, saintly women and was known for a complete devotion, a pure, unconditional love of God. Uh, she died probably in her 80s in Basra in um, 18, 1801. And her tomb is outside the city. Although there is a tomb at the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, and indeed another in Cairo, which have counterclaims to being hers. Certainly there is an account that she moved to Palestine before her death, which was in her late 70s, not her early 80s. And reputedly, as she was dying, she asked others to leave the room so that she could be with God alone. Rabia's philosophy, Rabia is perhaps the single most famous and influential renunciant woman of Islamic history. Rabia was renowned for her extreme virtue and piety. She was intense in her self-denial and de devotion for God. She never claimed to have achieved unity with him, in, uh, which as you know is, is, is a goal of Sufis. Instead she devoted her life to getting closer to God, something that I am trying to do. She was the one who set forth the doctrine of divine love known as Ishka al-Hakiki and is widely considered being the most important of the early renunciants. One mode of piety that would eventually be known as Sufism. Indeed, she, she made one of the greatest contributions towards development of Sufism. And she was the first female um, Sufi saint of Islam. But it's important to note that she was a not alone. And there were many important people within this early movement, which we now know as Sufism. Indeed, there's evidence that women led rituals, including dance and music, often of mixed audiences of males and females. Several aspects of Sufism suggest that Sufi ideologies and practice stood as counters to the dominant society and its perception of women and the relationships between men and women. The stories detailing the life and practices of Rabia show a countercultural understanding of the role of gender in society. Indeed, she was often challenged by Muslim scholars who were quick to point out that jurisprudence, but she was quick to point out that jurisprudence was created by men for men. <laughs> so, as you know, I'm somewhat critical of jurisprudence. And, uh, 
That's not actually the take I've had, but it's an interesting one, isn't it? She decided to stay <coughs> stay celibate <coughs> in order to leave her womanhood behind and devote herself completely to God, refusing many offers of marriage from important scholars and high-ranking men and indeed offers of great wealth um, to become the wives of wealthy men. Indeed, she was argued that she was unable to take a husband because she claimed an exclusive relationship with God. She referred to herself, to herself as a weak woman, and so others uh, called her this as well. Um, it may come as a surprise to some of you uh, non-Muslims, but Muslims hold Miriam, the Virgin Mary, with very high regard. Indeed, the tomb of Miriam is sometimes claimed also to be at the Mount of Olives. And Rabia's legacy was somewhat resurrected by, recently, by Christians. Although she's now, <coughs> I mean, really, really celebrated within Islamic popular culture. Indeed, she's now so celebrated that she's something seen as something of a champion of feminism within Islam and especially within Indonesia. Uh, but this highlights the problems I have in seeking the truth about her and remaining respectful to her. Can you imagine annoying both Muslims and feminists in a single vlog? It's a little like being critical of Black Lives Matters. To do so only exposes you to being accused of racism albeit that you may have some significant misgivings, possibly even founded within anti-racism itself. But worse still, I consider myself a Sufi, and I don't want to fuel the schism with Salafis. But when you talk, listen to Muslims talking about her, there's just so much virtual signalling as they cannot possibly know the truth about her life and what she said. Islamic scholars use her legend to illustrate many important concepts within Islam, but rarely could they, they be, be attributed to her. As I say, she would not have the reputation she does without having been recognised as somebody that was special in her time. But there's little else we can be sure of. Rabia did live the life of an ascetic. Her only concern was for God. And she paved the late way for later female saints. She reached a state which all Sufis strive for, the destruction of the nafs or the ego, the self. She certainly developed a relationship with God based on love and taqwal or trust. She devoted herself to God out of desire for uh, not out of desire for reward or fear of burning. Rather, she only wanted to please God and never be cut off. Poetry. And uh, now I've kept saying that so little, so little is really known about her. Uh, and nothing survived of her writing. Indeed, if she even wrote anything. As I say, much that was written about Rabia was written much later, and is almost certainly an interpretation. Often these are illustrated by conversations that she's reported to have had, even though there's no evidence that these conversations ever happened. So much is attributed to it. I mean, it's unverifiable, quite honestly. Maybe, just maybe, her poetry is more reliable than the biographical works. If only that the oral tradition of poetry was maybe better established and less open to abuse. Like Rumi, she expresses her love through God, of God through her poetry. And, and you know, I, I love her poetry as I do Rumi's, you know, who's, who's a real hero of mine. And she's probably the first Sufi to speak of this love as the root to the divine. In love, nothing exists between the heart and heart. 
Speech is born out of longings. True deception from the real taste. The one who tastes knows. The one who explains lies. How can you describe the true form of something in, a, in whose presence you are blotted out and whose being you still exist and who lives as a sign of your journey? However, expression of love is perhaps less overtly sexual. And nevertheless, still, still, it's, it's probably more protective, but nevertheless, it is erotic. It is erotic. It's very like rubies. In part, this reflects that in Arabic, there are many words that could be translated in different ways in, into English, including the word for love. I have loved thee with two loves, a selfish love and a love that is worthy of thee. As for love which is selfish, therein I occupy with thee, to the exclusion of all others. Uh, but in the love which is worthy of thee, thou dost raise the veil that I may see thee. Yet in praise of mine, in, that, in this or that, uh, but the praise is to thee, and both that and this. And now she does speak of Iblis, uh, but uh, the devil or Satan, but her poems seem to recognise that good and evil are internal to us, something which you'll have heard me argue many times. Oh God, take away the words of the devil that, that mix with my prayer. If not, then take my prayer as it is, devil and all. She appears also to describe how we must rid ourselves of detachments and desires. Again, something you'll have heard me argue many times. She explicitly turns her back on materialism. Ironic, but one of the most intimate acts of our body is death. So beautiful appeared my death, knowing who then I would kiss. I died a thousand times before I died. Die before you die, said the prophet Muhammad. Have you wings that feared ever touch the sun? I was born when all I once feared I could love. And she also spoke of the light, the light which I've spoken of many times. Indeed, she seems to see heaven as hell, as not as being eternal but maybe even as metaphors. Although I've heard many scholars arguing the exact opposite about her, as I say, I, I, I just don't trust what so many scholars say about her. They seem to use her legacy to prove their own biases or their own points. Indeed, she did not actually make claims on heaven and hell. And that this poem, poem they claim that this poem was not actually written by her when you know, it seems to be. I carry a torch in one hand, a bucket of water in the other. With these things I'm going to set fire to heaven and put out the flames of hell. So the voyagers to God can rip the veils and see the real God. In fact, she's said to have actually carried a torch and a bucket of water around. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this vlog. And if you have, can you help me out a little? Subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, and then you'll be notified of future vlogs. But also hit the like button and make a comment. Uh, because these seem to be what determine the um, YouTube algorithm. And I'm being really punished by it. So whatever help I can get from you is, is so appreciated. It really is. I'm... When I started this, I was going to do it, uh, this, this section. The real magic of Java I was going to issue. Maybe t every two, three months. Now it's, it's happening maybe every two or three days. So yeah, if you hit the bell, you'll hear about it. 
Um, and thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Really heartfelt thanks. <laughs>